Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Martini Mondays. Today we're going to make a sidecar, and I was doing a little bit of research into why this drink is named like that. So this is a very famous cocktail book by David E. Embury, who was a writer in the middle of the last century, and he says, The sidecar is the most perfect example I know of a magnificent drink gone wrong. It was invented by a friend of mine at a bar in Paris during World War I and was named after the motorcycle sidecar in which a good captain customarily was driven to and from the little bistro where the drink was born and christened. And originally it contained lots and lots of ingredients but he simplified it down to just three ingredients which are freshly squeezed lemon juice and it's always a good idea when you, when you squeeze lemon juice to put it through a sieve, a strainer, just to get rid of some of the little bits of pith. Then we have some Cointreau, orange liqueur, and some Courvoisier, some brandy. So, crushed ice in a martini shaker. And for two of these, we're going to do two ounces of lemon juice, two ounces of Cointreau, and four ounces of brandy. Put those all in the shaker. Shake vigorously. And then strain into coops. And there we have a sidecar. It's a nice color. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Oh, that is nice. Very refreshing. It is. Very nice. Thank you. So here we are, opening week. Uh, it's finally here. We've waited a long time. We did have uh, kind of a soft opening this past week. Congratulations on being back at the podium for those. Thank you. Um, but here we are, uh, the full opening night, and we're thrilled to have James Ennis returning to the symphony, one of the great violinists in the world right now. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience performing with him. Well, the last time we performed with him was last season. He played. The Elgar Violin Concerto, the, the famously impossible concerto that Elgar wrote for Fritz Kreisler. Um, and because he wrote it for Fritz Kreisler, he wrote it for a super virtuoso, and that means that very few people can actually play it. Um, James can play it, yeah. <laughs> he can play it amazingly <laughs> well. And um, that was really one of, the, my, my, one of my favorite concerto collaborations here so far. So yeah. really good luck um, that he was able to come short notice and of course he lives in Orlando, so he's just going to drive up, which makes everything much more easy than having a European soloist fly over in quarantine. Indeed. Um, and he's going to be playing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, a great piece that we all know and love very well. Mendelssohn wrote it for his friend Ferdinand David, who was the concertmaster of the Leipzig Gewandhaus. Uh, Mendelssohn was music director of that orchestra. Mendelssohn, of course, was one of the great conductors of his day, one of the great conductors full stop, because he was really one of the people who invented the job as we know it today, yeah. um, wrote a lot about conducting and was enormously influential for lots of people going forward. Um, and it's a beautiful concerto, you know, of course, the, the violin solo begins to play almost immediately um, in this very beautiful, tender, vulnerable, expressive line. Um, and there are a couple of little things that I really love that, that show Mendelssohn's personality, particularly at the end of the first movement. Mendelssohn hated audiences applauding between movements. And it was completely commonplace in his day for that to happen. People would, would often clap. Um, so at the end of the first movement, one lone bassoon note just is held on out of nowhere as if to forbid everybody from clapping um, before a very beautiful andante begins. And then the finale is back to the music of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's like elves dancing at the bottom of the garden. Very beautiful, happy music. Yeah. Um, so that's gonna be a real pleasure. Yeah. And um, like any good romantic concerto, it's full of virtuosity and beautiful, sweeping melodies, so uh, it should be great. Uh, the program opens with uh, an original composition by one of our own musicians, um, our violinist Pyotr Shevchik, well who wrote, <laughs> who wrote um, a fanfare for us entitled River City Fanfare. Um, and you've been working through that uh, the past couple of weeks as well. Yep, just finished learning it today actually. So this is a, a very, really nice, energetic, fun um, piece full of bravura, um, 
written for exactly our size of orchestra, which is great um, for this slightly smaller chamber orchestra that we're using this year. Um, and it's a sort of big sparkling piece with every instrument you can possibly imagine. So it's going to be a very exciting way to, to kick off. And of course, there haven't been that many pieces written for the Jacksonville Symphony in history. So it's exciting to, well, it's exciting to begin the season with a new piece, and particularly to have the composer sitting in the orchestra. It's yeah, a nice novelty. It'll be great. Uh, and then, of course, we close with, um, as I always say, a piece that needs no introduction, yet we're going to anyway, Beethoven's Fifth. Um, so, let's start with uh, some of the important things that people may have heard before, but are just these elements of this piece that are uh, indelible and incredibly impactful to music history. Well, the big thing about Beethoven V, the first movement, is that it doesn't have any tunes. It's a piece that's based entirely on one motive. We call a little fragment of music only a few notes a motive. And in Beethoven V, that of course is ba 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 bom, and that's it. That's the whole piece. And that's new at that time. That's completely new. Yeah. You go earlier, and instead of these little fragments, you have full themes. You have that that occur over several bars mm -hmm. of music. Um, but but this is a, a, a smaller unit. What's the what's the advantage of that, or what what's the uh, um, the function of of transitioning to that? Well, if you make a piece of music based on one tiny idea, it immediately increases the intensity of the music because you can never get away from that one idea, mm -hmm. and the idea is so arresting. And of course, there are a thousand interpretations for what it means. The the most kind of hackneyed, stereotypical, but useful idea is that it's fate knocking at the door, which Beethoven was reported to have said. Um, and because it's in C minor, Beethoven's favorite stormy, angry, unsettling key, the fact that we hear that little motif in basically every single bar of the piece creates five or six minutes of the most intense, powerful, harrowing, and deeply upsetting music that exists in classical music. The shape of the whole symphony is then a journey from that tension, from that darkness, from that unsettling fate motive, all the way to the finale, which is unbridled triumph and joy. And it's that very typical um, Hegelian, Beethovenian idea of a journey, a philosophical journey, from darkness to light, from despair to triumph, that was so much Beethoven's own and so much a big part of the, the German philosophy at the time. And, and while many people attribute him to a, a, a bridge, a bridging figure into the Romantic era, where it, it is no longer simply about, well, that sounds pejorative, but it's, it's, it's no longer about symmetry and structure, it's also about this uh, dramatic arc yeah. through, through the piece. I mean, Beethoven, of course, is full of Romantic ideas, because he's, he's an individual, his music is about expressing himself, he's the first person to do that, so in, in those kind of ways, yes, he is Romantic but he's still absolutely a classicist. And there's something very classical about the tightness of the construction of that first movement. And then we think about the second movement, a, a set of variations on a very simple theme that begins in the cellos. That's the absolute definition of classical proportion sure. and, and symmetry and structure and beauty. Um, then the third movement, very unusual, a, a scherzo um, that begins with this kind of strange rumbling arpeggio in the cellos and basses. Um, my favorite novel, um, E.M. Forster's Howard's End, has a quote in it that the people in the novel attend a concert of Beethoven V. And one of the Schlegel sisters, the, the goodies in the book, the nice liberal Democrats in the book, um, she says that she describes that rumbling as goblins. And then the big theme, ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum, which of course is the same motive as in the first movement, yep. changes again into something else she described as a trio of elephants. And I think that's kind of wonderful because it captures the mystery of the, of the opening and then the kind of plodding majesty of that main theme. Yeah. And then we move into the fourth movement in a way that uh, I can't think of uh, anything that came before this symphony that elides from one movement into the next and, and you just feel the, 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 it building like a train that's coming right. at you. The most remarkable passage the end of the scherzo goes right into the finale. And you're right, I can't think of, and I'm sure there is one, but I can't think of a famous classical symphony that has those, that kind of elision. But the way that Beethoven does it is designed to create the maximum amount of tension. 
So there's a kind of interrupted cadence. We think it's going to go to C minor, and instead we get this weird A flat pedal in the cellos and basses, mm -hmm. and then we have this timpani solo. Bum, 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 bum. Yes. Bum, 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 that rhythm again from the first movement, building and building and building, and it. So much tension is created that it's absolutely hair-raising. The, the first violins seem to get lost in all these strange arpeggios. The phrase lengths are all strange. And it's literally like the pot is about to boil over all over the stove and then we blast into the finale. Yeah. And we have this absolutely unbelievable triumph. But even then it's not over. And it's, it's very typical of Beethoven to, to make us arrive in a place of triumph at the beginning of the finale, but then remind us how hard it's been to get there because the music from the scouts of the goblins comes back again. Yeah, and it, a lot of people will joke about how Beethoven seems to just go on and on uh, trying to end a piece, but uh, I've always felt like it's, it's necessary balance. It, it, I think this is sort of what you're saying, but it, it's actually necessary to have that much balance for all the working out that's, that he's been going through. In the first movement especially. Yeah. Because the first movement is like a huge piece kind of trash compacted into this little five minute thing yeah and it takes all the rest of it to kind of balance that out yeah i think that's right um and also when you get to that point of elation in a beethoven symphony you, you want it to keep going because you want to enjoy the ecstasy of yeah. of how exciting the music is there is a really funny video on youtube of dudley moore back when he was on some variety show um doing a, a, a parody on a Beethoven, I mean, Dudley Moore was a great pianist. Yes, and, he was. And doing a parody on a Beethoven sonata, and it's about <laughs> three straight minutes of just 5-1 over and over. It's great. Um, so yeah, this should be really spectacular. You know, it's, it's, I think, perfect that we're doing Beethoven this week because um, I think you probably also saw this article that was um, published in Vox last week about Beethoven and um, elitism and really a, a sort of insinuating that uh, the constructs and the ideals in Beethoven's music perpetuated classism and, and elitism. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's absolute rubbish. I do too. Um, Beethoven was, first of all, very working class. You know, he, he came from lowly means. Mm -hmm. He worked his way up all by himself. Um, and he was an extremely progressive Republican. Mm -hmm. You know, he, want, he, didn't, he believed in the brotherhood of man. He had lots of very socialist ideas. Yes. Um, he believed in throwing down despotic rulers. You know, he scratched Napoleon's name off the beginning of the, of the Third Eroica. Symphony. Yeah. Um, and he was an individual. He believed, about, he believed in the individual. He spent his whole life fighting against classism in Vienna. You know, he thought that he was the equal of the aristocracy because of his talent, mm -hmm. and he refused to bow. He literally refused to bow to people in the salons of Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, so it's rubbish, but it's a warning to us because if people, if the piece has become that, if it's become a piece that makes people think of elitism, it's entirely the fault of orchestras and classical musicians since, who've made it a symbol of elitism. And I think that probably going to a classical concert going to hear an orchestra is sometimes seen as a, as a symbol of elitism. And we've got to do our best to blow that up and to make music accessible for everybody. But it's got nothing to do with Beethoven. Right. It's our mistake. Yeah. He is absolutely music for the people. All men are brothers, the lines are from the Fifth Symphony, yeah. Schiller's lines. Yeah. Um, I hate to say it, folks, but if you haven't got a ticket, you can't get one because we're completely sold out, which yeah. is a great problem to have. Um, but we will be live streaming. We will be live streaming. And of course, Masterworks 1, which has Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, will be exactly one week after. So please buy your tickets for that now as yeah. well. And look forward to talking about that next week. Yes. See you soon. So, thank you.